Don't you just love the book of Jude? <clears throat> I was saying on the way up here to my to my wife, man, I, I almost feel like adding anything to well, I mean, I don't want to add anything to it, but just preaching and trying to explain Jude, you know, I'm gonna ruin it because it just does so good, just preaching, preaching itself. But we finished first, second, third John, so I figured let's just keep on going. All right, so we're just jump into Jude. Still got to pray about Revelation. <laughs> but uh, let's get started. Jude, look at the beginning there. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified. Aren't you glad you're sanctified? You know what that means? That means you don't have to wait until after you perform a certain miracle and you're dead and enough people pray for you or whatever to be saint, to become a saint. You don't have to earn your sainthood. The moment you accept Christ, you're sanctified. You are made a saint, right, in, in Christ Jesus. Not your own works ever. Okay, aren't you glad? Look, at keep going. By God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad you're preserved? Amen. Right, I was thinking about a, 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 a 12 where it talks about you know they're preserved from this generation uh you know and forever so you know i realize there's a little bit of a discrepancy some people say that that's talking about the words of god well there's no doubt about it, it talks about the words the the words are pure words as tried by fire i mean it's talking about the words of god in that passage but i believe the words of god are preserved and then like this and many other verses we see that god also preserves his people you know he preserves his people in other words he's going to Make sure you get through the fiery trials and all that because you're following His will and you're wanting to do, you know, His work. He's going to get you through. Not only that, uh, He's going to pass on. Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So He's going to keep His church going and His people will be preserved. Aren't you glad you're preserved? Can't lose your salvation. Amen. <laughs> you got that uh, preserved, sealed until the day of redemption. So it starts off, Jude is talking... <clears throat> This is who he's talking to, basically just those who are in Christ, those who are saved. We also understand he's going to mention here some people, verse 5 through verse 7, who are not saved, right? In fact, it sounds to me like all the verses here talking about reprobates. I mean, he even brings up uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. He says uh, about these that they are... Uh, uh, you know, reserved and everlasting chains in the darkness. I mean, you compare that with Second Peter, and you see he's talking about some some reprobate uh, people there, and talks about those who have crept in, those who went after the error of Balaam and Cain and Korah, and so uh, we see such a great chapter. Uh, I guess there's only one chapter, but there's such a great book, uh, the book of Jude. But I want to focus primarily on that one verse where it said on verse three where it says beloved when i gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation so what's he writing about he's writing about the common salvation salvation for me is the same as salvation for you uh salvation is the same for the person over in africa or any other china or any other part of the world uh this common salvation and he's writing about that but what does he say it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should cont earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And so the title of the message this afternoon is What It Takes to Be a Contender. What It Takes to Be a Contender. <clears throat> I, think, uh, I think Paul was a contender, right? Paul was a contender. You're familiar with these passages, but let's look there anyway. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I love reading these verses. I think of Paul as a scrapper, you know, somebody who was into sports, into strengthening himself and physical fitness. I think he was. Uh, I won't get into all my reasonings for that, but certainly the illustrations that he used, like Hebrews 12, chapter 12, chapter 12 verse 1, it says, there, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him in uh, doored the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I like how he uses that idea of a race. 
you know, and, and some, you think of contending, right? You would think of somebody who is preparing for some kind of event where they're striving for the mastery. And so there he talks about laying aside the weight that besets us and, and uh, running with patience that race. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse 24, he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So then he goes on, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, unto subjection. No, I was right the first time. Into subjection. Let that by any means, when I have preached to others, I might, uh, I myself should be a castaway. So he's, t he's making the application and he's saying, you know, just like I would be training for a, uh, a race or just like I'd be training for a fight, I got to keep my body in subjection and all that. But then he then he tells you what he's talking about. He's talking about when he's doing the work of God, when he's preaching the gospel, he's contending for the faith. Right. And so this was a great example that we have in the Apostle Paul. And I want you to go back to Jude and notice this. The first point I want to make is the emphasis on the word the. Here in Jude, verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith. Uh, I don't know how many people in here would know the, the, the name, but uh, I grew up, the uh, first time I was in Kansas before we went overseas, and uh, no, I didn't go overseas. Anyway. Just disregard that. There was a man named uh, Art Wilson. Anybody ever heard that name by any chance? Uh, Art Wilson, you guys would have loved him. You would have loved his preaching. He's one of those guys who could preach for two hours and hold your attention. Not like me, <laughs> but he could preach for two hours, hold your attention. The stories, I mean, he'd bring them in at the right time, uh, you know, and they were, they were, he, he, had a, he added humor at the, in the appropriate times, but he also would preach and fling her down and and, uh, man, I, I love to hear him preach. I had the opportunity to take him into his, when I was in Springfield, I would take him into his office every day. The man was blind and, uh, or legally blind. And so he needed somebody to take him in. And, uh, you know, I was a preacher boy at that time going to Bible college. And I, was, I jumped at the opportunity and I would take him to, uh, uh, to his work, his little bitty office there in town. And he would go and he had this big magnifying glass and he could look and he could kind of barely make out the words of whatever he's reading or writing on or whatever. And, uh, and man, I just loved it. He'd give me a lot of, a lot of his, his material. Uh, he, there's one, uh, one booklet he wrote I remember called uh, uh, Why Some Baptists. Let's see. Why Some... Oh, man. How does that go? Why, why Some Baptists Remove the Name... Why some churches remove the name Baptist and why others should or something like that. Man, it was good. I need to find some of these and show them to you. <clears throat> but I remember him getting up. I'll never forget it. He got up and preached from Jude and he said this. He said, here's how you, you don't read that phrase. You don't say, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. He says, no, no, no. You say it like this. To earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. <laughs> Now, that really puts things into perspective when you think about what's he talking about. The faith, all right? There's one faith. The Bible says that. There's one faith. We have this common salvation, right? We, through faith, you know, trusted in the Lord, and he saved us. Through faith in Jesus Christ, that's the common uh, salvation. And, he's, and there was one faith that was delivered unto the saints. It was once delivered, once delivered. Now, in case you don't know this, it wasn't Catholicism. <laughs> that wasn't the faith that was once delivered into the saints. No, no, no. I know Catholics will tell you that. Oh, no, we were the original. Well, no, you weren't. That doesn't even make sense, okay? If you, if it, it, you, yeah. you deny the Bible, first of all, and say, well, it's not the Scripture alone. No, you have to have Scripture plus all these fathers. Well, those fathers were teaching corruption. That's easily proven. Okay, so it wasn't Catholicism. 
That wasn't the, the, the uh, faith that was once delivered unto the saints. It wasn't Protestantism, right? Because that kind of like was got coming out of Catholicism saying, whoa, we went wrong in a few areas, so let's reform this thing. And uh, they kind of went into a reformed uh, theology. Well, guess what? That's not it either. <laughs> the faith that was once delivered is timeless, right? We would say uh, at least Baptistic, all right? I don't care necessarily if someone doesn't call themselves Baptist as long as they teach. Like a I mean, I would prefer them to call themselves Baptist, but uh, you don't know what a Baptist is. Uh, there's some DVDs back there. I think they're great DVDs uh, about that subject, and you're welcome to take one with you if you've never really studied the subject on being a Baptist. But, you know, no, I don't believe, I know John the Baptist, I understand that. I don't think they were called Baptists back in this day. But, you know, what they were teaching is the same thing because it is all in the Bible, right? And so this was the faith that was once delivered unto uh, the saints. Now, it's interesting that you find in the Bible, before the Bible was even completed, I mean, while the apostles are still writing this down and getting it together, there are those who are creeping in and teaching all the, all the things. You take some of the teachings of Catholicism, you find them in the Bible, and it says, watch out for these errors that are coming in. You take the errors, you know, of uh, Gnosticism and, and even some uh, 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 Pentecostal, like charismatic type teachings. These were creeping in in the early days. And so uh, uh, he, he was having to warn them. Look at Galatians. By the way, that part where, where I'm talking about in, in verse 4, he says, For there, were, there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord, uh, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Lord, Lord Christ Jesus. And so the, uh, the idea is, again, common salvation. There's only one salvation. There's only one faith. This is the common faith, right? What is it? Faith in uh, Jesus Christ. Believing in Him, trusting in Him, that's, that's the same. So he says, well, and some guys have taken the grace of the Lord and have turned it into lasciviousness. Right? right? He goes on later on to talk about people like the, these false prophets like Cain, these false prophets like Balaam, these false prophets. And what are they doing? They're all looking for their own gratification. right? And they're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Here's what we see in, uh, in uh, Galatians chapter 1. I mean, Paul led these guys to the Lord through, well, let's just call it what it is, easy believism, <laughs> right? I don't like using that name because, I, I mean, that phrase because I know what people mean and I want to I, I wanna make it clear that, hey, we're being thorough. We're making sure people believe the gospel, not just some kind of crazy, like just say a magical prayer. Nobody's teaching that. And so I try to make that clear and somebody says easy believism. I understand that, you know, hey, we need to define some terms here, just like lordship salvation. We need to define some terms here. But let's just go to Galatians and see what happened here. Galatians 1 verse 6 and 7 says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Well, what were they, how were they perverting the gospel? Look at chapter 3. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? See, these guys were trying to take people back under the law and saying that that's part of your salvation. You're gonna, if you're gonna, you know, you have to keep walking with God and doing all, uh, you know, all these as part of your salvation. Look, that's another gospel. That's not the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. And so, <clears throat> Jude found it necessary to exhort believers to earnestly contend for the faith. Okay, now let me uh, go back to Jude, or let's think about that verse again, and let's emphasize another word, okay? These are the points of the message. Uh, first of all, was earnestly contend for the faith. Number two, earnestly, here's what he wants to tell people, earnestly contend for the faith, okay? Earnestly contend for the faith. Now, I did a little uh, study on this, and I talked about it in Sunday school this morning in Iola, 
uh, but the word contend, it's kind of interesting. You might wonder where the, the, what the etymology is, what the history of the word, but uh, to contend, you got con, uh, in Spanish it would be con, right? It's a, a Latin word meaning w- with, right? Uh, con, and then you have the other one, uh, tenir, right? So you have content or tender, I think it is, which isn't a Spanish word. We looked at, I tried to find a Spanish equivalent, but anyway. In Latin, it means to stretch. It's kind of interesting, but what it's literally saying is like stretching oneself in order to get something. So you're stretching, and I think about contending means you're going to have to like stretch yourself and your ability and make make yourself able to do something, right? You're going to have to grow. You're going to have to be challenged. You're going to have to exercise, kind of like Paul. It was Paul a contender? Paul was a contender, so he said, hey, I, I got to keep my body in subjection. I got to do, you know, he's, he's contending. He's, he's laboring and stretching himself. And Jude says, I found it necessary to tell you that you need to contend for the faith. A very similar word in the Bible is strive. Okay, now we tend to think of both contention and striving as bad things, as negative and it can be, all right? So sometimes uh, we use the word striving and contention. Look at Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs 13. Now look at verse 10. Proverbs 13, 10. Only by pride cometh contention. But with the well-advised is wisdom. All right, so oftentimes when somebody is contending with another person, you know, you think about like they're just, they're, they're arguing with them. You know, contention, contention in the Bible is sometimes physical, contending with, with somebody in battle, for instance, or fighting against them, or, or one nation going to battle with another nation. They would be contending in battle. Uh, but also, it's sometimes just like verbally, you know, arguing with somebody, fighting with them or whatever. And so sometimes when we talk about envyings and strives and contentions, it's just talking about people who, according to this verse, Proverbs thirteen ten, only by pride cometh contention. So it, it has to do with the, the motivation be, be behind what you're contending for, right? If you're contending just because you want to look better, you want to look smart, you want to look more intelligent, you want to cut somebody down or whatever, that contention is based in pride. Okay, so that's bad. That, that is not a good biblical way to contend, all right? But look at uh, Proverbs 28. We also, we obviously know contention can be good. Proverbs 28, verse 4. They that forsake the law... Praise the wicked, but such as keep the law, contend with them. Okay, so if I just forsake God's law, I don't really care, you know, what God has to say. I'm going to do it my own way or whatever. I'm in, a, I'm in essence praising the wicked. I'm going along with the wicked. I'm saying what the wicked does is fine, right? I'm praising the wicked. But if I uh, keep the law, I'm actually contending with the wicked by simply keeping the law. Have you ever noticed, like, if you just start living for the Lord, like, all of a sudden people think that you're being contentious? <laughs> all I'm trying to do is live for the Lord, right? Well, what, do you think you're better than me? No, I didn't say that. I'm just saying that this is what the Bible says. So you think you're better than me. What are you? Are you my judge? <laughs> right? That's what they, all of a sudden they think you're contentious. They want to shut you down. They want to get you censored off of social media. They want to get... Why? Because you're simply... Uh, saying that this is what the Bible says, this is right, this is the law Amen. of God, they find that contentious, right? But that contention is motivated on God's Word and righteousness. The, mo- the contention is mo- motivated in pride and envy and self- selfishness and greed. Okay, so we want to make sure contention is uh, for the right reason. The Bible certainly says, and this, what are we talking about again? The common faith, the gospel, right? The Bible certainly says that the gospel itself can be contentious. Look at uh, Philippians 1.16. Philippians 1.16. Uh, 
Let's see, let's back up a little bit. Uh, let's start in verse 12. But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. What's Paul talking about? Well, he's sitting in jail, right? He's, he's received so much persecution. He's, uh, uh, he's been forsaken by a lot of people, right? And he's, he's sitting there uh, in, in this situation, and he's saying, hey, this all happened for the furtherance of the gospel. And here's what it says. Uh, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. He's saying, hey, God's going to use this, right? This is, he's going to use this. He's in charge. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Look, he's thinking about the positive things that are coming into effect by the fact that he is in bonds. Some, indeed, preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. Now, let's stop right there. Here's what I think is being said. Some people have the wrong motivation for going out and preaching the gospel and being contentious and contending with people and saying, you know, uh, look, man, you ever seen the street preachers with the bullhorns? Yeah. And they're in there and they got Jesus saves on their shirt and they're preaching the false gospel, right? <laughs> but they're preaching. Look, that's, that, same, uh, that same type of behavior or that same motivation could happen even with people that have the right gospel. You know that? And you could be all about, hey, I just like to fight. I grew up a scrapper, and I just, you know, uh, I just like to challenge people. I like confrontation, soul winning. Well, amen. So do I. Looking for people in uh, uh, to give to uh, when we go to Eldorado Springs to uh, be able to give the prospects to, you know, any any contacts we have, especially anyone that gets saved. Uh, give them uh, over to these church churches and say, hey, you know, th these guys could use a follow up, whatever. And also for some places to use the tracks and all. And a place in uh, Stockton, Missouri. And the guy said, uh, he said, yeah, we actually go out to El Dorado Springs. He said, we got a bus route that goes out there. He says, we try to go out there and knock doors about twice a year. I said, well, praise the Lord. I said, now, what do you mean by knocking doors? Are you just, you know, trying to, because you got the bus route there, are you just like canvassing, trying to get new bus riders? And he said, no, no, we believe in confrontational soul winning. Well, amen. That doesn't mean, confrontational doesn't mean you're just like, you know, <laughs> no, thank you, I'm not interested. Well, you better be interested. Don't you know you're going to go to hell? I mean, that's not what I'm talking about, confrontational. I'm just saying confrontational is saying, look, I love you enough to tell you the truth. And I need Amen. to tell you that if you die right now, you're going to go to hell. Amen. And I know you might not like to hear that, but let me show you the, the gospel. Right? Let me show you Jesus Christ. The one that can save you. That's confrontational soul winning. That's, that is a type of con contention. All right, We're contending for the faith. And unfortunately, you don't have to knock very many doors before you find out how many false teachings have crept in re the, re the Christian religion, the big umbrella of Christianity. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian too. We all know we can't just say, well, praise the Lord and go to the next house. We've got to ask some more questions and we find out They've been influenced by Catholic teaching. They've been influenced by you name it, all the kinds of things out there. And they're all messed up on the gospel, you know, over and over. Well, I think you got to live right and you got to you got to honor the Lord. And, you're, you know, or sometimes they'll say you got to believe in God. And you're like, yeah, what about God? Anybody else? <laughs> what about Jesus? Oh, yeah, him, too. <laughs> I had a Catholic lady one time say, well, here's what you got to do. Or, or here's how I know I'm going to heaven. She said, I believe in God the Father, God the Son, and Mary. <laughs> Whoa, Mary became the Holy Ghost, I guess. <laughs> I thought that was the weirdest answer I've ever heard from a Catholic. But, uh, but anyway, you understand, false gospel. I mean, we're contending for the faith. Amen. And it's so simple, though, isn't it? Yep. The gospel is so simple, and yet people, uh, all this false doctrine has uh, crept in false preachers preaching a false gospel, man, don't do it. But if you stayed home, watched uh, TV preachers for a little while, you'd get sick to your stomach, right? What is going on? All these false teachers are creeping in, teaching damnable heresies. Guess what we're supposed to do? Contend for the faith. Amen. These guys are turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ into lasciviousness, right? We want to preach, no, no, it's grace, the grace of God through faith alone, right? 
That's that's defen- that's a uh, uh, contending for the faith. First Thessalonians chapter two. First Thessalonians two two. Well, let's just start with one. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Right? There's a, there's a contending going on. Now, it's not a contention that's based in pride and arrogance and selfishness and greed. No, no, no. It's a contention for the truth, for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. There's a, there's a, a good contention. Jude's saying, hey, I found it needful to write unto you about uh, that you and, and, and exhort you that you would earnestly contend for the faith. Okay, so uh, first of all, earnestly contend for the faith. Second, earnestly contend for the faith. Okay, uh, I always think about a boxer when I think about a contender. I mean, I think that's, that's, that's pretty common. Uh, people think about a boxer and, and uh, what makes a good boxer you know, what makes them so good? Well, sur- surely there are people that are born with certain genes that make it a little easier for them, you know, makes it a little easier. And, and, and granted, there are some people that have a gift of the ability to speak, the ability to, uh, uh, you know, win people over with their personality or with their charm. I mean, some people have a certain uh, gift, but you know what? If you don't use that, if you don't work at that and make it better, it's not going to be effective, right? We have to contend like a boxer contends. What does a boxer have to do? Well, uh, anybody know Cassius Clay? I don't want to call him Muhammad Ali because he gave himself that name. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Muslim name, but his name was Cassius Clay. <laughs> he says, uh, uh, you know, he, he thought he was Superman, you know. And anyway, so Cassius Clay used to say this, though. He really was a good fighter. There's no doubt about that. And he would say, and, and you know, you could break down the uh, the science behind his technique and the, some of the methods he used, and some of the stuff might not be that, that uh, might have been proven to be ineffective. But here was his strategy. If you read some of the old boxers and what they did, they'd get up super early, man. And so Cassius Clay used to say, I've got to get up earlier than my opponent. Let's say he's training to fight against uh, George Foreman. I don't know who, the, <laughs> who some of the guys he fought. Uh, and so he's like, I got to get up earlier than he's going to get up, right? So that so that I know that I'm you know I'm putting in the extra effort. I'm out there early and I'm and I'm really working. And he's like, and I got to hit the gym and I got to stay in the gym longer than my opponent, right? Because because I got to put the work into. You know what he's doing? This is the third point. He's earnestly contending. Right. He's earnestly content. Look, it's 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 something that's going to take some work and we need to be willing to put in a lot of effort into uh, this contending for the faith. Uh, we want to be used by God in a great way. So uh, the question is this. Just how bad do we want to win? That's the, that's the question. Now, Paul was willing to give up everything. He's willing to get thrown in jail. He's willing to be you know, he said I would be accursed. If I could, you know, I'd be a curse so that I might win my brethren. You know, so he was willing to give up everything because he wanted the gospel to be preached. He didn't want to be cons- considered a castaway, good for nothing. He wanted to be uh, uh, profitable. He wanted to win. He was in it to win it. So he wanted to, to uh, keep his body in subjection and all those kinds of things. How bad do we want to win? How bad do we want that crown? You know, he was contending for a crown. I, I tell you, this is the, the third potluck that we've done, potluck 100 coming up. And uh, let me just, you know, um, this is analogy. Spiritual things, what much more important than bodily exercise, I understand that. <laughs> this is an analogy. This is the third potluck coming up. How many have I finished? None. <laughs> Couldn't even run last year. This year's not looking great, I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> And every year I'm thinking I gotta lose X amount of pounds and I gotta do this and I gotta do that. And then every year as it gets closer, I'm just like, I don't really want it that bad. <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. 
the first time I ever ran 100 miles. I wanted it bad. I just, I'm just, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to eat just, you know, nothing but fish and, I mean, <laughs> greens. And I don't know, I had a, I had a real strict diet, salmon. And, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to put in the work, wake up three o'clock, hit the road. You know, I, I, I was just, I was just really pushing myself. People thought I was nuts. I was losing so much weight. People were like, you got something wrong with you or what? What's going on? <laughs> No, I was just really pushing myself because mentally I was focused and I was like, I really want to finish this thing. Now, not win it. I knew I wasn't going to win it, <laughs> but I wanted to finish the race. Okay, well, when we're contending for the faith, what we need to do is have that same mindset. How bad do you want to win this thing? Look at 1 Corinthians 19. I mean, 1 Corinthians 9. We already read it once. Let's look at it again. 1 Corinthians 9. And before I read it, I'll just tell you this. So, so what did I get out of my first 100 miler that I ran? Let me just tell you about it real quick. It was in Oklahoma City. It was on Route 66. We started at the Red Barn on, uh, on Route 66 in uh, Andover, Oklahoma. I'm going to say Andover? No, what was it called? I can't remember. Anyway. And, uh, and, and uh, so we started there. And it was a straight shot. It wasn't an out and back. It was just straight, 100 miles. I mean, you're going to do it. you got to have somebody come and uh, be your, your, your aide and, and follow you, be your crew and all that. <clears throat> I had to train for, uh, I mean, I, mean I, I think the longest I had ran was a half marathon. That was like in April, right? The 100-miler the was in uh, November. So I really didn't have that long to go from running 13 miles, which had taken me like, you know, a long time to get to that, to go to a hundred miles. And so I had to train like crazy. I got shin splints, ran through them. Some people said, oh no, you got to stop. You got to rest. Got to let your shin splints run. I was like, I don't have time to rest. I just kept on going till my shin stopped hurting. And then I was like, hey, I ran through them. And I was just eating, you know, I was real picky about what I ate. Uh, I was doing all that. So race day comes. Uh, well, let me back, back up. About a month before the race, I'm calling it a race. It was, you know, it, I just wanted to finish, but you understand. A month before the race, I was like, I got to make sure I can at least do 50. And so I decided uh, to do a trial run. My wife, I'm sure, was very thankful <laughs> to, to follow me around for an entire day <laughs> as I tried to run <laughs> 50 miles. And when I hit 50, I made it. When I hit 50 miles, I was like, I can't take one more step. I mean, I couldn't even eat. We, w we went to go eat. I was like, man, I want a steak. And we're sitting down, and I'm looking at that steak, and I'm like, I just want to go home. <laughs> I can't take one more step. And in my mind, I'm thinking, wait, wait, wait. In a month, I've got to go 50 more miles than that. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I just tapered off and said, we're just giving it a shot. Race day came, same thing. I got to 50 miles. I was like, I can't take another step, and I'm only halfway done. It was getting dark cold, put the headlamp on, had to get warm clothes, and, uh, and I just went out there, and I just kept pushing myself, pushing myself, pushing myself. Uh, you say, man, why would you spend, and a lot of these ultra runners will spend like an entire year just totally dedicated to this race, you know, making sure that they, now again, that most people want to win a race that they participate in. I just wanted to finish, but, <laughs> but you say, well, man, you must have really got something fancy for running, you know, this 100 mile. I mean, you know, that much effort. Now, somebody paid my way, but I don't know. And, uh, plus the gas expense, plus some people take off work and all this kind of stuff. Man, what did you get for winning or for finishing that race? I'll show you. I got a belt buckle. <laughs> Wasn't that worth it? I also got a piece of the Route 66, the road that I was running. I got a piece of the road and bragging rights, but <laughs> that's it. Now, some people will idolize that thing. They'll put it up on their wall, and they'll be like, oh, man, look, I can't. Can you believe I did that? I ran that race. This is, this, to say the least, this is corruptible. <laughs> this is nothing, all right? What's it say in uh, 1 Corinthians 9? And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. 
Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. If someone would go through all the trouble to be a contender, right? I mean, what do you really, I mean, you get millions of dollars to be a professional boxer, but <laughs> a belt, right? That's going to be handed down to the next person next time you fight because you're going to lose. <laughs> You know, but these will, these guys will just go uh, spend their entire life training for this. R runners, you know, and and cyclists and all they'll they'll spend all this time training, and they just really really want it. They want the prize. They want the prize. It's just a corruptible crown. It really doesn't mean anything. Anything in life that we could strive for, money, you know, friends, all that kind of stuff. That's gonna that's we're gonna lose that one day. The things that we do for Christ are eternal. Amen. They've got eternal value. If somebody will be willing to go through so much effort, right, to, to finish 100 miles or, or to be part of it, think about what we should be willing to do for eternal rewards, right? That's what matters. Now, I still want to finish that 100 mile there again, <laughs> but I don't really have that drive for it. But I'll tell you what, what we all need to do is figure out how we can more earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in this race. And I pray that you'll help us to uh, run with patience the race that's set before us. I pray you bless, Lord, this church and uh, in our efforts to win souls and to preach the gospel. And I pray that you would bless uh, uh, those who, who give so much, Lord, that they might be able to... Uh, uh, lay up treasures in heaven. I pray you be glorified by it and that you would bless that. But help us, Lord, have the right motivation not to be uh, contentious because we're envious or, or uh, prideful, but because we love your word, we love you, we love uh, uh, righteousness, and we want to earnestly contend for the faith. I pray that you be blessed now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.